Here, in lecture 3, we are going to analyze the instruction set of the architecture. Now, this is covered in a textbook in under Appendix A, which, is, which deals with primarily the instruction set of the architecture. We'll also do some basic review of pipelining, which is covered in Appendix C of your textbook. It has it talks about hazard detection, dependency analysis. So what we will do here is we will first start talking about the instruction set and then continue into pipelining. Now those of you who have taken this architecture course, the basic one, which is the computer organization, this would seem to be a review. And for those who have not seen architecture courses, uh, this would be a a good review of the material that will be very essential as we go further into looking at instruction level parallelism and multiprocessor and multi-core topics. For processor designs, we have two parts. One is the specification. This is the instruction set architecture, right? This specifies how you are going to implement basic instructions on your microarchitecture. So the instruction set generally sits at the boundary between the hardware and the software. So at the boundary, we have in software, we write mostly assembly codes, right? Such as add, subtract, multiply, divide. So these are some of the basic assembly code that is written mostly in software. At the hardware level, we actually have the implementation of it, which we call as the microarchitecture. Right. So, so the instruction set sits at the interface between the software and the hardware. It also specifies the logical machine that is visible to the programmer. So the programmer, when he writes his C code, such as A equal to B plus C or, or some simple addition, subtraction, something like that. Now that high level code will translate into an assembly code, such as add 1 R1 comma R2 comma R3 where all these three R1 R2 R3 are registers right so we will translate the high level code into an assembly code and that specifies a logical machine which is visible to the programmer we can also do the functional specification of the processor design so we can specify exactly how the processor is going to function in terms of the hardware component such as the ALU, the multiplexer, the, 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 the memory, the, the, and so on. Now, if you look at the instruction set architecture, one of the first questions you want to ask yourself is what are the needs to be specified by the instruction set architecture? Now, instruction set architecture can, can, be, can be divided into different classes. Everyone has their specifications. If you look into uh, embedded computing, they might have simpler instructions to execute. If you look at uh, x86, you might have complex instructions to execute and so on. The first thing you will need is to define certain state. And by state, we imply addressable memories, right? So we want to be able to access value from our memory. And this is what we do most of the time. We, we load something into our memory, we store values from our memory and so on. At the same time, we also need temporary storage in the CPU, such as we need registers, accumulators, where we can do data manipulation. So we need two things. One is memory to store our text and data that we use in our program. And temporary storage is where we can access and manipulate registers and these these registers accumulators are closer to the processor the next thing you'll have to specify by the instruction set is what exact operations do you need it to do right so you you want to ask yourself what to perform add addition subtraction multiplication division logical operations shifting operations moving data variables a number of operands per instruction that you would require and you'd also want to specify the operand location. So where are these operands located? You can specify the operands in the instruction itself. You can specify the operands to be registers. You can do indirect addressing. You can do direct addressing. 
Uh, you can also specify the type and the size of the operand. So you can say how many operands you need, uh, whether they should be uh, integer operation operands or floating point operands. In, in terms of the, the size, you would specify whether you want one operand, two operands, three operands, and so on. Right? You can you can you can specify the exact number of operands you want. The more operands you are going to specify, you are you expect the values to be already in those registers. The lesser number of operands you specify, then one register might be like the default register. For example, let's say you have one operand. Then let's say you want to do an operation such as multiply. Now, if you say multiply register R1 then you need to know another register. So there is a default register such as probably an accumulator where the value is loaded and you then multiply with this register R1. So you will need to specify the type and the size of the operand. And the size and type of the operands will dictate your data path, right? The data path and control that will specify how the data exactly is going to move from your memory to your um, ALU where the computation will, will take place. The next thing you will need is these instructions to be encoded into binary, right? Everything in our processor, everything is stored in binary values. That is, everything is stored as bit sequences, ones and zeros. You will need to specify some way of encoding them. And that encoded values should be stored in your memory. Most often, we will encode all of this into binary, and then we convert this binary into hexadecimal, right? So it's written as 0x, 1, 2, 3, 4, something like that. Because we, would, we, we do not want to have these long strings of 1s and zeros, which is very difficult to read. To simplify, we use hexadecimal in our memory, which makes it easier for us to read and analyze these uh, values. And when you scale up, that is, instead of having a uniprocessor, let's say you have a multiprocessor or a multi-core architecture. Then you need to worry about other aspects such as coherence. This is the way in which values stay consistent across in, in multiple caches. Because each processor is going to have its own cache and it might have data in its own cache at any given point in time. So to make sure that this day, these data stays consistent, you need to have some cache coherence protocol which maintains consistency across different values. Given in multiprocessors you have more than one processor, you also need to read and write values from memory. So the memory has to provide a consistent view to different processes that are accessing it. And there comes into the question what kind of memory consistency values you expect. Keep in mind that when you have multiple cores or multiple processes, different elements, different nodes are reading and writing to the memory. So you want to make sure that the last written value is the one that is read by the next processor. And there are different kinds of consistency models uh, which can relax the constraints of how these reads and writes will play a role. So we have to define coherence, consistency, and we need some ordering assumptions. We need to, uh, we need to make sure that the, what is the ordering specified in which different cores are going to read. And that is specified by the memory model uh, that you want to use. So, when you look at this, what are the things that you want to specify by the instruction set? You need a state. This is mostly for addressable memories, memories that you can access. You need temporary storage in your CPUs, registers, accumulators, and these registers could be floating point, integer. It could be specific registers for multimedia. These are MMX registers. You could have registers for vector processors and so on. Then you need to specify what operations these, these registers need to do. You can specify that I need some arithmetic operations, some logical operations. We also want to specify the number of operands per instruction, which will then play a role into decoding that instruction. We need to specify the location of it, the size, the type of it, and we want to specify some amount of encoding, decoding, uh, and then as we scale up to multiprocessors, we need to look at memory model.